All right, guys, what up? This week we have another AMA coming at you. You let me know the questions in the YouTube comments. I answer your questions. So make sure you're subscribed, answer your questions below, and I'll keep on answering whatever questions you have. So let's dive into this week's AMA. Let's get it. This question is what foods can lower your glucose levels? So different foods can have different reactions to how your glucose is going to respond. Now, typically foods that are higher in sugar and carbohydrates will lead to a more drastic spike in your glucose levels, but this is not necessarily a bad thing. If you are metabolically healthy, you don't really need to worry about this and you can eat foods that will, you know, affect your glucose in different ways and you will have a good response to all of those different ways. However, there are some really cool things you can do to help this and it involves nutrient timing. So if you do fats and proteins in the beginning of your meal and then you have carbs at the end or maybe you wait a little bit and then you have some carbs, the glucose spike is going to be lessened. It's going to be dampened because your body has digested fats and proteins. There's plenty of studies on this. So fats and proteins without any carbohydrates are going to lead to less of a glucose spike, but you shouldn't really be scared of a glucose spike. You should use it intelligently. I like to get carbohydrates in after I work out and before bed, but if you're trying to blunt that glucose spike, try loading your fats and proteins first. The next question is why am I not a fan of body wash or what body wash do I use? So I'm just not a fan of traditional body washes such as Old Spice and all these body washes with artificial fragrance in them, which is simply just going to negatively affect your endocrine health, your hormones. You don't want to be rubbing artificial fragrances onto your body. There's really no need. What I use is Dr. Bronner's or a company sent me some beef tallow soap. That is what I use for body wash. I'm not against body wash. After jujitsu practice, you sort of have to use some type of soap because you're on the mat sweating with other people, but I, I'm not a fan of rubbing blue one and artificial fragrance on your body. There's no need for that. The next question is about liver health. What should I do for liver health? How would I go about fixing my liver? So the chances are your liver probably doesn't need fixing unless you are maybe an alcoholic and you have like liver cirrhosis or something like that. But in regards to just liver health in general, there are a couple things you can look at. In your liver, there's a master antioxidant that it makes called glutathione. When your body's glutathione levels get depleted, this can be really negative for your health. And there's a couple ways that you can, you know, replenish that glutathione. You can take glutathione as a supplement, or you can take N-acetylcysteine, which is a precursor to glutathione, and it's going to naturally raise your body's glutathione levels. There's also alpha-lipoic acid, which is a supplement that you can take, which is commonly marketed to diabetics to help them manage their blood glucose, but in reality, it's just a really good antioxidant for your body. And then don't drink alcohol. That's another thing that's going to really mess with your liver health. Try to abstain from alcohol as best as you can. And, you know, when I do have a drink or two, like I was just in Costa Rica, I did have a drink uh, with my buddy, I made sure to take N-acetyl cysteine that day because it's going to help with that liver health. So the next question is, is an animal-based diet good for fat loss? So in all reality, what is going to work for fat loss is being in a calorie deficit. That is sort of the most important thing for fat loss. Obviously, I'm a fan of doing that with real whole foods because I feel like it's a more sustainable way. So if you want to eat animal-based in a slight calorie deficit, I think that's a great way to lose weight. You're cutting out a lot of those processed foods that are very, you know, meal opioid. It's what it's called. The systems in your brain, you have these opioid centers and they get, you know, basically activated by grain based foods, uh, gluten, stuff like that. So if you want to include those foods while you're trying to lose weight, it's just going to be an uphill battle. It's going to be really difficult to do. And there's studies on this. There was a study that showed one group that ate unprocessed real whole food and one group that ate um, processed food. And they were told to eat the same amount. The processed food group ended up eating 500 more calories per day just because those foods are hyper palatable. It's really hard to overeat foods like steak, fruit, you know, stuff like that that's in an animal-based diet. So yes, I'm a fan of it, but make sure you're in a calorie deficit. You can't just eat tons of calories animal-based and not work out and not burn calories and expect to lose weight. That's not going to happen. The next question is, how do you know if your bowel movements are healthy? So uh, from what I've heard from all functional medicine doctors is you should be pooping one to two times per day, not more, not less. So that's a good, you know, basically a good marker to look at right there. When you wake up in the morning, you should usually drink some water and you should have to have a bowel movement shortly after that. Um, if you are going days without pooping or if you are pooping multiple times a day, you need to look into something. You need to fix your gut health and look at your diet because that's not really normal. The next question is, what are my thoughts on chewing tobacco, snus, all that type of stuff that people do with, you know, orally active nicotine routes? I am not a fan of them at all. Now, nicotine can have some cognitive benefits, 
but it's very short term and it's very dumb to think that you're going to use chewing tobacco, reap some benefits without drastic side effects. First of all, what is in these chewing tobaccos is not just tobacco. You're talking propylene glycol, you're talking artificial flavors, you're talking food dyes, you're talking preservatives, really, really bad ingredients, and we know that they are linked with cancers of the mouth. So what I always tell my friends who like do this chewing tobacco stuff is, is it worth it to you to have you know maybe half of your jaw removed when you're 60 something? If that's worth it, sure, do chewing tobacco. I think it's extremely dumb. Personally, I would not use that stuff ever. I wouldn't put it in my mouth. We know that it's linked with mouth cancer. Look up a photo of somebody with mouth cancer and decide if it's worth it. The next question is about vitamin D. How much vitamin D should I be getting if I live in an area that doesn't get a lot of sun? So if you are able to get total body sun exposure, and this literally means, you know, in like little board shorts in the sun for a good amount of time, then you can get your vitamin D that way. But if you are not able to do that, which the vast majority of people aren't able to, either there just isn't enough sun where they live, or if you have very fair skin, you're not going to be able to sit in the sun in board shorts for that long. You're going to get burnt, which is not good for you. So this is why supplemental vitamin D is probably the single most important nutrient and most important supplement in the world. It is cured a lot of people, uh, various diseases. We know the World Health Organization recognizes vitamin D. It's not really up for debate if vitamin D is good or bad. Now, how much to take is going to depend on your body weight. Me personally, I weigh 160 pounds. And when the clouds are out and it's not sunny, I take 5,000 IUs per day. And then I go get my labs checked. I like to be in that 60 to 90 um, nanograms uh, of vitamin D. I don't like to let it drop below that. Um, but you know, the traditional health establishment will tell you to be somewhere around like, oh, if you're above 40, you're good. I don't really buy that at all. Uh, but you can do your own research on that. Get your vitamin D levels tested. But if you haven't been getting sun or if you live in an area that's cloudy, cloudy, you can definitely be safe with just taking some vitamin D every day. How much doesn't depend on your body weight? Do some research into that. The next question is how can you boost testosterone naturally? So there are a few things that are scientifically researched to help you with testosterone. It's not gonna be all this fancy stuff, guys, that, oh, you can do this, you can do that. I'm not about to get into that. It's really the basics. If you are limiting your sleep, if you're not getting deep sleep, eight to nine hours of deep sleep, quality sleep, you are massively affecting your testosterone. And I know this from personal experience. There was one, I get my testosterone checked all the time. I'm usually between 700 and 800 on my testosterone labs. There was one time we came back from Dallas and I forgot I had a lab test scheduled. I just completely forgot. We were up all night. It was a long night and I was like, I drank too. I rarely drank and I was like, oh my God, I gotta go into the lab and get the testosterone done when I flew back. Flying really just takes attitude and sleep on the plane. And I was like, let's just go do it as a joke or whatever, I'll get my lab checked and my testosterone was 394. Three weeks later, it was 794. So that just shows you that sleep and partying and stuff like that will massively affect your testosterone. So that's the first thing. The second thing is getting good whole nutrition. Your body is basically using nutrients to make testosterone, nutrients like zinc, nutrients like carnosine, acetyl L-carnitine, oftentimes nutrients found in meat. So, and healthy fats and cholesterol also do help your body produce hormones. So diet is gonna be the third thing. And then there are some supplements and protocols that you can do to help your testosterone. Uh, we know that Tonget Ali can help with testosterone, so can Osh ashwagandha. Now they do them in different mechanisms of action. Ashwagandha is going to limit cortisol. So I like to take it in the evening and it's going to help your body produce testosterone as cortisol is catabolic to testosterone if you have chronically high cortisol. Tongat Ali has different uh, mechanisms of action, but it appears to increase FAS. H and testosterone. So Tongat Ali is super beneficial. That's something that I've been experimenting around with, but plenty of sleep, good nutrition, uh, lifting heavy weights occasionally, that's gonna be your go-to for testosterone. The next question is, Brendan, should I wear SPF in the sun? Should I wear sunscreen? What do I do? So. The answer, the short answer is if you're going to get burnt in the sun, yes, you should be protecting yourself from that. Getting burnt is not good for you. However, if you are able to get in the sun like I do without any type of sunscreen, any type of SPF, and sort of gauge that time of when you're gonna get, you know, maybe burnt and get out of the sun before that, that is also good. I think getting tan is very healthy for you if you're not getting burnt. So let's say you have fair skin and you really can't spend that much time in the sun, what would I do? The first thing you'd wanna do is throw on a t-shirt, long sleeve shirt, or a hat, use actual physical protection from the sun. T-shirts have SPF, we're talking sun protection. So you can you know, SPF yourself by wearing a hat and a T-shirt, a long sleeve, something like that. And now if you want to wear some type of sunblock, I would get a non-nano zinc oxide mineral-based sunscreen. If you Google beef tallow sunscreen, there's a few companies making ones that I like and I, I've used some of them. 
And what you wanna avoid is the chemical-based sunscreen. So these are sunscreens, and on the back, they'll say an ingredient like oxybenzone, avobenzone, octocrylene. I would not use those. I would go with the mineral-based sunscreen, and that's what I would do. The next question is, Brennan, what do I do about chlorine in the swimming pool? So let's say you're a high school swimmer or water polo player or something like that, and you're worried about the effects of chlorine. Um, the simple thing is, yes, and I, in an ideal world, you would be in a saltwater pool or the ocean or a lake, but that's just not gonna happen. So what I'd say is the benefits of doing a sport like water polo or swimming definitely outweigh any negative effects of chlorine. Um, you know, So I wouldn't worry too much about it. I get in pools sometimes that have chlorine. Now, you wanna be careful to not be drinking a lot of this water. I would make sure to get plenty of fresh water before your swim workout or your water polo workout, and then I would make sure to get plenty of water after to sort of dilute some of that chlorine that you might ingest. Now, there are gonna be some drying effects on your skin and hair because of this. I would definitely look towards something like a beef tallow moisturizer. Uh, there are some people who basically spray a product called glycerin on their skin and hair before they go into the water, and this provides sort of a barrier. You can find a product that's rose water and glycerin. I've heard of some swimmers doing that. But yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about it if you're getting exercise in the water. The next question is, Brennan, how long have you been training jujitsu? So I've been doing jujitsu off and on for years now. I think almost like, you know, seven years, something like that. But, um, you know, when I was in college, I really wasn't training that often. I'd pop in here and there. And I don't train that often now. I train like twice a week now. So yeah, I've been doing it for years now. Um, I really absolutely love it. And with jujitsu, I think like it's all about you know what you want to do with it. I have friends that compete and go super hard. I have some friends that are some of the best in the world at jujitsu. They train every single day, multiple times per day. Um, the jujitsu bug definitely bit me, and I fell in love with it. But it's not something that I want to you know be the best in the world at, or you know uh, do a lot of competition stuff like that. I honestly just want to go train with my buddies, have fun. And so that's what I do with it now, and I love it, highly recommend it. The next question is, Brendan, is it okay to eat steak every day? Is it okay to eat red meat every single day? Let me know what you think. So my thoughts on this is I like to have some variety in my diet. Red meat is an extremely good source of nutrients and protein, and I do eat it often, but I do like to have some variety. The reason for this is different types of you know fish, eggs, meat, chicken, stuff like that will have different nutrient profiles, different amino acid profiles. Um, fish has more omega-3s than red meat, stuff like that. I think red meat is king. I think it's absolutely amazing, but I like to switch it up. So what I'd recommend is throwing in some chicken, throwing in some fish, throwing in some lamb even, although it's a different type of red meat, it's still a slightly different you know, nutrient profile right there. And it's also just good to have variety and be able to cook up different meals. You don't want to be so stuck on just red meat all the time, although hey, it's delicious, it's great. Uh, you want to have some variety in your diet. If you really, really love red meat and that's all you want to eat, I guess that's okay, but I would look into throwing in some fish at least and maybe chicken once a week. The next question is, Brendan, what are your thoughts on MSG, the uh, monosodium glutamate, the food additive that's in a lot of you know food products nowadays, but traditionally associated with Chinese takeout food, stuff like that. So while I'd love to sit here and demonize MSG and say that it's evil and it's gonna kill you, I've read the studies on it and it really doesn't appear that MSG is extremely harmful. However, it is positively correlated with headaches in many people, so that leads me to to believe that there might need to be more research done on monosodium glutamate. Um, there are also studies in this sort of glutamate receptor uh, in the brain, uh, in, in, even with just glutamine powder, which is a great supplement. I just took some earlier today, but people who take really high doses of glutamine powder sometimes can throw off this glutamate receptor um, pathway in the brain and they can have negative effects like headaches. Uh, you know, they can just kind of not feel well. So you might want to be aware of MSG. It's not something that I'm like going out and using a lot of and trying to cook with and eating a lot of it, but um, I'm not into the whole camp of like, oh my God, MSG is going to instantly kill you. But yeah, the next question is, Brendan, what are your thoughts on fresh homemade pizza? Is this something you would eat? Um, well, sort of the answer is it's going to be way better than a normal store-bought pizza. And what I would say with a lot of these cheat meals, and I think you would agree with me that pizza is not really like a health food. So if you're going to do something like that, I think going the homemade route or going a bit higher quality is the way to go. I'm definitely going to go to Italy at some point in the next, you know, four or five years, and you'll probably see me on my Instagram and TikTok and YouTube eating, you know, some pasta and pizza. Because, you know, I think if you're out there, you know, one in Rome, as they say. So what I'd recommend is if you really like pizza, don't just waste it on some Domino's or Papa John's bullshit. There's gonna be really bad ingredients in there. If you're going to cheat on your diet with some pizza, 
Homemade pizza sounds like a great way to do that. The next question is, what are the best sources of omega-3 fatty acids besides fish? So eggs are actually a great source of omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA. And then we have grass-fed, grass-finished red meat. They're not an extremely rich source of omega-3s compared to fish, but they still do have some omega-3 fatty acids. So I am a fan of foods like lamb, grass-fed, grass-finished steak, and eggs to get omega-3s. Fish is amazing. I've been eating a lot of wild salmon lately. I was just in Costa Rica. We ate sushi a good amount. Um, so fish is something I'm a fan of. But overall, if you're trying to not eat fish for some reason, then you can look towards eggs and red meat and get a decent amount of omega-3 fatty acids from those foods. The next question is, Brendan, do you keep up with politics? So I sort of here and there do. I sort of, you know, don't pay that much attention to it sometimes. I think overall it's okay to, you know, get interested in these type of things and listen to, you know, podcasts and stuff. But if you get too wrapped up in it and it distracts from your life, that's just not really a good thing for health. A lot of this new stuff is designed to spike your cortisol levels. And if you just waste all your time with, you know, these opinions on different things that really don't affect your life, then it's sort of a waste of time. But also in that same vein, Having no, no idea with what's going on in the world, I don't think is also intelligent either. So I do like to read, you know, the New York Times. I have my subscription there. I watch different types of news sources, try to get different types of opinions. But in all honesty, focus on yourself, focus on your health. And if you find some of that stuff interesting, that's fine. Don't get too caught up in it. Okay, the next question is, Brendan, what are your thoughts on sparkling water with natural flavors? So I drink these sometimes, uh, like a Perrier, you know, that has some like lime flavoring or something like that. I think it's fine occasionally. One issue with these sparkling waters is sometimes the cans are lined with plastic. So you're getting some of those PFAS in that sparkling water. So that can be sort of dangerous right there. What I would say is a better route is to get some San Pellegrino, take like an actual orange, just squeeze a little bit in there. And that's gonna give you that same thing right there. And you'll be able to get that San Pellegrino in glass. So you're avoiding some of those PFAS, stuff like that. The next question is about rest days. Brendan, should I be taking a rest day in my workout program? The answer is absolutely yes, but on that rest day, you don't wanna just do nothing. You wanna use that time to do corrective exercise, maybe do some walking. You can even do some light cardio. If you're just lifting heavy weights seven days out of the week, at some point, you're gonna have negative results and a negative feedback loop that happens. You need to let the body recover, and it also helps your hormones recover. You don't wanna be putting that intense stress on the nervous system every single day. You wanna have it come in ebbs and flows where you're really stressing the nervous system out, then you're letting it recover. Then you're really stressing it out again, you're letting it recover. So I am a fan, of, a fan of rest days. I take about two per week, but they're not complete rest days. Sometimes I'll even surf if the waves are small on a rest day. Sometimes I'll even go to jujitsu and just not train really hard on a rest day. I'm just making sure to not stress my nervous system in you know a significant amount. The next question is, Brendan, what do you think about processed meats? We're talking ham, we're talking salami. They, you know, they say they don't see me eating these a lot. So I'm not really a fan of processed meats. Now there are traditionally cured meats and there's jerkies. I'm not really against those, but I'm not really eating that many processed meats because some of the studies on processed meat and I'm not talking about the you know correlative studies where they're like oh this group ate meat and they're they're unhealthy I'm talking about some of the actual studies with the additives that they put into these processed meats so I'm not a huge fan of them I'm not against them I'll eat some turkey some salami some ham whatever but it's not in my regular diet I think they're a good option when traveling like if you're gonna go on a, a flight or something like that you can maybe get some turkey and some salami and like have that maybe make a nice charcuterie board whatever here and there but I wouldn't be adding these into your daily diet. The next question is about sleep supplements. Brendan, what are some supplements I can take to enhance my sleep? What are some proven supplements that you can take for your sleep? So there's a few that I'll cover. Number one is magnesium glycinate. There are studies showing that when you take magnesium glycinate before bed, it can enhance your sleep. The next is L-theanine. L-theanine is an amino acid that you can take that is going to benefit your sleep. I like to take about 200 milligrams. It's in our Santa Cruz Paleo Deep Sleep Formula. The other supplements that I like are lemon balm. There's some studies on lemon balm and sleep. That's also in the Paleo Deep Sleep Formula. Another supplement that has a lot of benefits with sleep is CBD. Now CBD is accessible to some people, not accessible to others, but if you take CBD about 45 minutes before bed, there are studies showing that it can enhance your deep sleep. Another supplement that I'm a big fan of is valerian root. Now valerian root, like any root, there are different grades and forms and basically qualities of valerian root. So in our CBD deep sleep capsules, we have valerian root, but it's a really high quality valerian because I have taken valerian before and woke up a little groggy. And with this one, I don't wake up groggy at all, but it's a really high quality valerian. So those are some supplements right there that can help you with sleep. All right, guys, that is it for this week's AMA. 
As always, leave your questions below and I will get to your questions. Anything about health, about life, any questions you have for me, let me know below. And if you're subscribed, we will get to your questions. We will answer your questions. So yeah, we appreciate you so much. We just restocked the horchata and chocolate protein on Amazon and the orange electrolytes are out. Dragon fruit and lemon lime will probably be back by the time this episode is out. We're working on mango. We're working on releasing a vitamin D. We're working on releasing magnesium potassium capsules and we're working on some grass fed grass finish whey protein for you. So that's some stuff we have, you know, popping off of Santa Cruz Paleo. So yeah, we're just putting in a lot of work right now. Uh, you know, nose to the grindstone, just working away. So ask me your questions below and I'll see you next week on the next AMA. Peace.